I'm Darlene Shea, one of the board, museum board members, by the way, and I just wanted to introduce Kaylee. Uh, she's our no museum operations manager, and uh, for for a, a while, and hopefully for maybe a long time, we'd like to keep her as long as we can. Anyway, uh, this is her this is her thing, and uh, I'll let her take take it away. Yeah, thanks so much, Darlene. Okay. Yes, and we had um, a very successful day. A lot of you folks um, were around earlier this afternoon. We had our um, Edwardian Christmas program. This is part of it, but this morning was the first bit, which was our, our uh, craft workshop. Very successful. We had a wonderful turnout from people in the community, people all the way from Charlottetown who came just for us, and we're so thankful for that. Um, so uh, really, really happy to see all you folks out um, to support this program. Uh, we really appreciate it. So uh, I'll get started and hop right into it. So uh, my talk today is about the commercialization of Christmas. And so when you think about Christmas in the modern era, visions of presents, shopping trips, stocking suppers, or suffering bank accounts may dance in your head. Um, even the more humble parts of Christmas, or even if the more humble parts of Christmas, like religious services, delicious meals, time spent with family, even if those are more important to you, the commercialized nature of Christmas Day really can't be ignored. And it seems like every year it only continues to grow. Uh, it seems like Christmas goods are on the shelves in the store before back to school things are. Um, the TV, radio, and social media advertisements are, can be truly unrelenting. But we all know Christmas didn't used to be this way. Um, Christmases of yesteryear are looked upon with fondness for being centered around what are deemed traditional values, um, like homemade homemade gifts um, to family and togetherness. These were considered the most important elements. So how did we get here today? What changed um, to alter the way that we celebrate and view Christmas? Uh, so the commercialization of Christmas is our topic today. So we'll start out by learning a little bit about the origins of some Christmas traditions and how Christmas has been celebrated historically. Then we're going to discuss the role of print media in the commercialization of Christmas. And after that discussion, we'll narrow it down a bit to Prince Edward Island, specifically, where I'm going to tell you two Christmas stories um, from before and after the turn of the 20th century to see if we can find any changes in the commercial nature of PEI Christmases. And finally, we'll delve into some local Christmas newspaper advertisements to really get a good understanding of how Christmas commercialized right here in Prince Edward Island. So let's start by looking at some of the earliest Christmases. Dozens of practices and traditions from cultures all over the globe have come together to form what we think of as Christmas today. And this, these, many of these traditions span back millennia and predate the advent of Christmas itself and predate Christianity as well. In fact, humans have been celebrating winter solstice around December 21st for over 12,000 years. In more recent history, um, celebrations on December 25th were instituted by Pope Julius in the, 12th, in the 2nd century to align with the birth of the Roman Sirius sun god, Mithras. And this holiday was called Saturnalia. And many other cultures, um, such as those practicing pagan values, celebrated winter solstice around the same time, um, December 21st. And starting in the 4th century, leaders of Christianity under Roman Emperor Constantine in the Church of Rome chose December 25th to celebrate the birth of Christ because of these pre-existing, well-established traditions in other religions it would have been even easier to get people to convert to their religion if it aligned with their pre-existing celebrations. And Scandinavian Yule Logs um, find its origins during the time of the Saxons, before the Norman Conquest. Um, however, the Yule Log would have burned for 12 days at that time, instead of 12 hours. Caroling even finds its origins during the time of the Saxons, before the Norman Conquest. You can see here it was called last sailing, which is a form of caroling involving a lot of alcohol. <laughs> And there's a great number of more that I could go on all night about the interesting connections of all of these um, tradition, all these long, long-standing traditions that uh, connect to the present. But if we just look a mere 200 years into the past, to the 1820s, the 1830s, or even the 1850s, Chris, on a Christmas day, it would not closely resemble what we t today consider to be a traditional Christmas. It was often a very muted affair revolving around religious practice and adult sensibilities, certainly not centered around children. And depending on your particular background, um, some, uh, or yes, depending on the particular background, some early colonials in North America used this occasion just to dance, gamble, hunt, or go visiting. 
Um, Christmas trees during this time were still German, uh, a mostly German practice that was not yet widely known. Even Charles Dickens, a famous author, very closely associated with Christmas, um, just described the Christmas tree as that pretty German toy in a Christmas carol. In fact, if you were celebrating Christmas any time before 1870 in the United States and Canada and 1871 in the United Kingdom, you would have not had the day off work because it was not considered, a na it was not a national holiday. In fact, the majority of people paid, no, paid Christmas no attention at all. Perhaps most interestingly of all, at some points in time and in some cultures, Christmas was highly frowned upon and even illegal. Um, a moral and cultural highlight of the Enlightenment era was the concept, was this sort of concept of the Protestant work ethic. Although this term wasn't coined until 1905, the concept existed since early, early colonial times. And some argue it even helped Amer uh, European migrants survive in the unforgiving and sparsely populated uh, colonial settlements. This idea is centered around self-reliance, perseverance, hard work, and most importantly for our discussion today, frugality, modesty, and practicality. It was very so closely associated with the Puritans of early colonial America. And when it comes to holidays and celebrations, this philosophy on life severely restricts how elaborately um, these, are cel these holidays and festivals were celebrated. Under this thinking, there's even a very well-documented decline in the celebration of early modern festivals. They were in being impeded or even curtailed by these cultural pressures because they instead pu prioritized public order and refinement. Um, funnily enough, holidays were thought to stifle industrial production. Um, it would bring a loss of trade, an interruption of businesses um, by forcing these business closures. Thus, Puritans, Quakers, and a great number of other groups partially discouraged Christmas traditions and saw them as distinctly anti-Christian. Celebrating Christmas was actually illegal in Scotland for 400 years. Yule bread, uh, baking Yule bread was a criminal act, and it wasn't until 1958 that Christmas was even a holiday in Scotland. Christmas was also illegal in 17th century Boston. If you were caught showing a little Christmas spirit, you would have been fined five whole shillings. Mind you, this did vary um, greatly, and many Southern American colonies celebrated it more readily. Um, but even when it was celebrated, it looked a lot different than what we're used to today. So, what changed? Public notice, forbidden. Um, what changed? So, however, during the Victorian era, a cultural shift occurred. And this shift left Christmas unrecognizable. The Victorians are well known for ushering in an age of commercialism and industrial production. The second industrial revolution began around the middle of the 19th century, 1850s, about, um, and with it came a boom of industrial productions. Um, they used cheaper synthetic materials, and a lot of production became entirely mechanized. And during this time, there was a wider distribution of stocks, which meant that more and more people had something to gain from increasing production and increasing sales. Um, sorry, and so therefore, these manufacturers and salespeople and stockholders of the 1940s and or 1840s and 50s started to conceptualize Christmas a little differently than the generations that came before them. They realized that instead of hampering production and wasting time, there was a potential for mass consumption. Consumption that would lead to profitability, economic growth, increased, and increased industrial productions by intentionally and strategically encouraging, reviving, and making minor adjustments to these pre-existing holidays, um, they could create predictable, ever-growing yearly cycles of consumption that would mean big profits for stockholders. And we can see the proof of this very intentional marketing strategy in trade papers. So trade papers were essentially um, journals that business people could sub sub subscribe to. They would provide readers with um, the latest news, trends, and tips for their field of business. And a number of such trade journals existed, um, and just two, for example, are the Dry Goods Economist that we have here and the Dry Goods Chron Chronicle. In 1895, the Dry Goods Economist published the following quote, National festivals are not always celebrated with the same amount of enthusiasm. Let merchants set the pace. In April of, of, of 1900, an edition of the Dry Goods Chronicle wrote, Never let a holiday escape your attention, provided it is capable of making your store better known or increasing the value of your merchandise. 
This evidence shows a very deliberate strategic approach to marketing that saw factory owners and merchants alike using holidays to their advantage to push more con consumption from their customers um, to grow their business. And this concept was used to take pre-existing holidays and amplify their importance or alter their meaning. And this idea certainly didn't apply to only Christmas. Um, there was many holidays that were transformed and even invented during this period. Um, the idea fed on itself, and as the decades passed, holiday advertisements, store displays, and product availability grew. And by the end of Queen Victoria's reign and the, and the turn of the century, Christmas was almost unrecognizable from the holiday it had been 175 or even 50 years before. And now that we understand um, the, now, we, now that we have an understanding of the greedy, profit-driven schemes of early Victorians, it's worth questioning how this massive marketing campaign actually came to influence customers. The Victorians were raised by these aforementioned stingy, straight-laced, and economic generations that came before them. So how could people be convinced to part with their hard-earned money um, to buy presents and decorations and so on when this is not how they would have grown up? Of course, a phenomenon like this has many, many elements, one that we could research and talk about for, for weeks on end. Um, but the one that we're going to focus on today is print media. Uh, now, throughout the Victorian period, we saw some of the biggest improvements to print media. Um, st steam printing, there we are, um, steam printing is, that is printing using the power of a steam engine, um, began making it faster and cheaper to print newspapers. In 1861, the United Kingdom ended uh, the taxation of newspapers, which led to a major rise in pu local publishing. So merchants and agents of capitalism, armed with their schemes and ever-improving print material, meant that a different kind of Christmas began to pop enter the public imagination. For example, in 1848, an image of Queen Victoria and her husband, um, Prince Albert, decorating a Christmas tree at Windsor Castle, was published in a great number of media. Now this made the public go wild. Already a pre-established, beloved couple, it didn't take much convincing to get people to follow whatever trend they were putting out into the world. Um, in fact, this trend um, or idea entered the homes and minds of the public so quickly that Charles Dickens, who just a few years before had called um, the Christmas tree that pretty German toy, um, public, uh, produced a short story entitled A Christmas Tree in 1850, where the main character, who's an elderly man, is reflecting with no fond nostalgia upon the Christmases of Christmas trees of his childhood, despite only being two years after this practice had even entered the Western imagination, Dickens seems to forget this and allows a character to reflect upon a non-existent practice. Um, Dickens' popular text, um, in fact, also is partially responsible for chil uh, centering children around the holiday. Um, Tiny Tim, from emotional uh, marketing techniques like Tiny, T Tiny Tim from A Christmas Carol. Um, encourages readers to form an emotional connection to a child who needs charity. And print advertisements uh, began to implement exactly the same idea, using children to emotionally persuade people into making Christmas purchases. Now, traditionally, gift giving was a, um, was a charitable act performed by the most wealthy in order to showcase their benevolence. And this is actually an example I found from a Prince Edward Island newspaper um, I must have written a year somewhere. I believe it was the 1830s, um, and this is talking about the um, charity of the um, Marquise of Waterford, the young wife of the reckless and wild Marquise of Waterford. Uh, she's talking. They're talking about um, her um, her generous gift giving. She was uh, distributing cargoes of coal for Christmas um, amongst the poor. And so that's an example right here from Prince Edward Island of exactly this thing. Um, this is your first Christmas gifts is um, very wealthy people displaying their benevolence. Now, as the years continued, however, and print advertisements continued to evolve, evolve the emphasis on purchasing um, grew, and now gift giving was encouraged amongst friends and family. Um, many long-standing traditions, just like this, were emphasized and altered under the lens of commercialism. Now, I want to show this phenomenon of changing print media on a local scale using local newspapers. Before I do that, however, I want to take a step back and tell you about two different Prince Edward Island Christmases. Now, one is actually a few, but that's okay. That's, they are from the 1850s and 60s, and one from 1929. 
Both of these stories come from Western families, live, both living on Prince Edward Island, but you're going to see that their accounts of Christmas vary greatly. Among, although mere generations apart, their celebrations are very different, mm -hmm. um, as the first comes from just the, the very beginning of this commercial transformation, and the second comes a few decades after this has already been in practice. Um, so I, want to give, I wanted to give as many examples um, as possible that were as local as possible, but the reality is there exists very, very little material in the way of first-hand accounts of early Victorian Christmases on the island, but one well-documented family provides a glimpse. So the Harris family, this is the son of the folks I'll be uh, talking about today, um, the Harris family originally, uh, originally came from Liverpool, England, and they immigrated to Charlottetown in 1854. And so many examples of correspondence between um, Sarah Harris and Martha, um, a relative back in the homeland, exist, and they give us some really insightful glances into their first North American Christmases. And mind you, this family came from a highly industrialized manufacturing and trading city. Liverpool was even deemed the second, or dubbed the, set, set, the second city of the empire. Um, as its uh, importance was really comparable to London. Um, so the Harris family certainly hailed from an urban center in which the latest trends would have been present. In these letters, however, the events of Christmases were hardly a noteworthy topic. Many years, it wasn't even mentioned at all in the letters. So on December 24th, 1857, in a letter between Sarah and Martha, um, the only mention of Christmas was that Sarah had made a plum pudding in preparation for the upcoming day and that Tom and Papa had just been out to gather a few spruce branches, quote, for a little decoration, so we, so we shall have the appearance of Christmas. Now, Christmas of 1858 did appear to be the most eventful. Sarah boasts to Martha about how happy her children were to gift her and her husband with some homemade gifts. Uh, these presents included uh, letters written on some embossed cards, uh, a necktie, crocheted blue wool cuffs, um, a crocheted blue wool mat, and two pin cushions. Now this gift giving had been prompted by the children's school teacher, um, and the presents were all homemade. Sarah also mentions that the church was prettily decorated for Christmas. These, however, were the only mentions of the holiday in the letter, and there was no talk of the children receiving any presents themselves. And the Christmases of 1859 and 1860 received no mention at all in Sarah's letters, um, 1850 or 1863, um, they are December 22nd. Sarah writes that she has yet to make any um, any preparations for Christmas, but intends on making some mince pies. Now the years continue with no mention of Christmas um, until 1865, when Sarah thanks Martha for sending the children free Christmas cards. Um, some years the letters there were letters written around Christmas, but there was no mention made at all. In fact, they often talked about the pork business that the family was involved in, rather than um, any Christmas events. Now, this isn't to say that the Harris's family, the Harris family Christmases weren't eventful or special. Um, Sarah likely left out a lot of information in her letters. Um, however, it's obvious that Christmas simply wasn't a big deal. Now, the second story takes place a little closer to home, in Prince County, Lot 16, and it's called Vera's Christmas Away From Home. Um, this story is documented in Marlene Campbell's Vintage Christmas. Many of you may be familiar with her work. Um, it's a very valuable collection of oral history testimonies from rural Prince Edward Island. So I will skip the first little bit as um, Vera is just reflecting on um, her the beginning of the conversation uh, in the uh, in the home that she's in. Um, but I will start off with uh, a few paragraphs in. Well, I thought that might be difficult. I knew exactly which Christmas was the most memorable. Despite the fact that I was only a few days short of my 93rd birthday, my memory was still sharp as a tack. As I settled into the story that was welling up in my mind, the mundane smells and sounds of my current surroundings gave way to the powerful memory of the Christmas of 1929. This particular Christmas, I was 10 years old, and growing up on a farm in southwest Prince Edward Island, Lot 16, uh, overlooking the Grand River. My family was cash poor, but I wasn't aware because I had parents who cared for me. Good food on the table, a comfortable bed, and a nickel in my pocket every Sunday for the collections. Um, up to the age of eight, I was an only child. Then mysteriously, a brother arrived to be part of the family. Although the age difference between us was significant, he caused little disruption in my world. My life revolved around my friends, church, school, 
in the barn. I basically lived in the barn. There were always kittens to be played with, uh, calves, piglets, and lambs to be fed. If father was not about, I would disobey his orders and would climb up on a barrel to curry the workhorse. I would brush the, I would run the brush over his heavy shoulders and curving back, loving the feel of his strength beneath my, beneath my small hands as I breathed in the smell of his fur and skin. When I wasn't in the barn doing chores, uh, for, or doing chores for my mother, I entertained myself with outdoor play. The changing seasons brought opportunities for swimming down at the shore in the summer and sledding on the hill behind the house or skating on the field ponds in the winter. Christmas was a special and busy time. The teacher in the one-room schoolhouse would distribute parts for the Christmas concert weeks in advance, and I strove to rehearse until mine was letter perfect. Where there were geese and ducks to a butcher and a draft and dress, new feather ticks to be stuffed, my, hubbit, my mother helped me make cookies and other special treats in the kitchen. My father would take me to the bottom of the farm fields to pick out a tree to put in the house, and we would all take part in decorating it with simple homemade ornaments. Then, of course, it, there was the anticipation of Santa's visit. It didn't matter what he left. Um, it didn't matter that what he left was not elaborate, it was always priceless in my eyes. There would be a coloring book and crayons, a new book to read, and my eyes lit up in delight at the new clothing my aunt had made and the hard candy that my uncle, who managed the Brace, McKay, and Co. store in Summerside, um, would bring. My mother, sparing what sugar she could, would make sweet bread fudge. What more could a child want? I was so eager for Christmas 1929. When I woke up on the morning of Christmas uh, Eve, the school concert was over, the tree was decorated, though still there underneath, and there was good smells coming from the kitchen. The anticipation rose in my stomach as I thought of what just one more sleep would bring. I scurried to dress and head downstairs to get my chores done because I wanted enough to do nothing to upset the generous nature of Santa Claus. What a surprise when I walked into the kitchen and there sat my grandmother, McCausland. I assumed she had come for Christmas, but my feeling of delight had quickly turned into disbelief. My parents, who were also in the kitchen, um, proceeded to tell me that I would be leaving home for Christmas. I was to pack a bag and go visit with my Aunt Margaret and Uncle Bowman in the village of St. Eleanor's. And I was to be quick about it. Father had the horse hitched to the sleigh and he was ready to be off. What was this? Oh, I liked my aunt and uncle well enough, but I certainly did not want to spend Christmas with them on my own. However, I did not create a scene or give voice to the many questions racing through my mind. This was an era in which children were meant to be seen and not heard. I quickly sat beside my father in the sleigh as the little man, step by step, transported us along the new road uh, from southwest to Muskush and then along the Cannon Road. My mind worked feverishly to come up with a reason why I was being banished from my home for Christmas. Obviously, it was about me, for my 20-month-old 20 20 brother wasn't going anywhere. I thought, and I thought, and then I thought even harder at trying to come up with an answer. I had been diligent about my chores. I was obedient to my mother and father. <coughs> Other than the horse, could they have smelled him on me? <coughs> Maybe they had discovered that on occasion I snuck across the road to play with the neighbor children when I was expected to be working. But those are the only two rules I had broken. Surely they weren't serious enough to have me sent away for Christmas. With my mind still working at top speed, I searched for more reasons for this unexpected trip. I didn't tease my brother, or the cat, or the dog. And most importantly, I had not risked the sin of doing homework on a Sunday. So why, had, why was this happening? The only answer that made sense to me was that with the unexpected arrival of my grandmother, um, there was no time to bother with me. Now, how would Santa know where to find me? Most importantly, would he still want to find me? Eventually, we arrived at Aunt Margaret and Uncle Loman's home. The Adams farm was neatly tucked between the Tanton farm and the Darby farm, names that I had heard associated with the United Empire Loyalists in the, in the American Revolution. My aunt and uncle's house was a beautiful old home with 12-foot ceilings and filled with fancy furniture. The most amazing things in the house to my eyes were a fireplace and running water provided by a cistern in the cellar. Aunt Margaret kept the place like a museum. When she got up in the morning, regardless of the weather, she threw open a window at the back of the house and she threw open a window at the front of the house to let the wind blow through and she began to clean. Since my Aunt Margaret, mother's older sister, made her own money as a tailor, her house held objects my mother could only dream about. She even had a splendid fur coat. 
Uncle Loman, originally of Port Hill, was a cheesemaker as well as a farmer. He had a fine herd of cattle and bottled and sold milk by the court right from his farm. He was considered very successful, a fact proven by his ownership of one of the first cars in the area. Uncle Loman and Aunt Margaret had just one daughter, Belle, who was, uh, had a job teaching school down east. She was home for Christmas, and all three of them seemed very strict and concerned about manners. Father had left me instructions that I was to behave myself and cause no trouble. Oh dear. <laughs> oh yes, I gotta pay more We'll get back to it as soon as I'm done. Um, and do, 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 uh, very successful, Father left me with the instructions that I was to behave myself and cause no trouble. He didn't need to worry. If I got into trouble, it certainly would have not been intentional. The Adams family did their very best to make me feel at home, at least the best you can do without telling your child what is happening. Somehow, I managed to sleep that night, and Santa Claus did find me. Although my memory of what he brought me has now escaped me, I do know with certainty that it would not have been a doll, for there was no money for dolls. On Christmas morning, Aunt Margaret informed me that we were having special guests for Christmas dinner. Summerside's police officer, James Sullivan, and his wife, Margaret, they were invited, and I was to be on my best behavior. My heart dropped into my stomach. <laughs> I had met Officer Sullivan before. He wasn't very tall, but he had a large paunch. And that, combined with his gruff voice and police uniform, meant I was terrified of him. When they arrived, Mrs. Sullivan was wearing a beautiful dress and white gloves, something I had never seen before. Aunt Margaret put on a show with the table setting. It was beautiful, and the food was delicious. But she was an excellent cook. We had a duck and a, um, and a moist capon with all the trimmings. I did them proud. I sat up straight, and I used my best table manners, and I made it successfully through the meal with no blunders. But sadly, no enjoyment either. They took me to the Christmas service at St. John Anglican Church just down the road, and Aunt, Aunt Margaret gave me a penny for the collection. I was mortified. At home, I was always given a nickel. I could not imagine only placing a penny in the collection plate when it passed. This is what I did. By evening, I was not a happy girl. I sat out looking the window, wondering what was happening at home, and when Father would be coming back for me. Boxing Day passed just the same way. When it seemed like there was no hope, I finally heard the horse and sleigh in the backyard. There was Father, stomping the snow from his boots at the door, and Uncle Loman invited him inside. They were all laughing, shaking hands, clapping each other on the back, as though something exciting had happened. And Father said to me, Vera, you have a new brother at home. Would you like to meet him? The sleigh run home seemed to take forever. My father had not even brought the sleigh to a stop in the yard before I jumped out and rushed into the house. And when I laid my eyes upon my brother, baby brother Wendell, the story of the birth of Christ took on a new meaning. I suddenly understood what the shepherds must have felt on that night so long ago. I smiled at the tiny bundle. He was much better than a doll. Wendell was the Christmas gift that kept giving. He livened all of our lives, for there was nothing he did not get into or try. I had him in my life for 76 Christmases until a heart attack claimed him one beautiful September evening in 2006. He lives on in my heart and memory as the gift that both ruined and made the Christmas of 1929. <laughs> now let's get this up and going. there's a few pieces of historical context that we can pull out of this. Um, Vera discusses some of the more traditional Christmas activities that we are all familiar with, like preparing food, getting ready for winter by filling up the straw ticks, um, religious services, and even a Christmas tree, which still would have been completely unheard of to for great-grandparents or even grandparents, depending on the number of, gener or number of years between generations in a family. However, Vera mentions some distinctly modern and novel notions in her story that show a changing, commercializing Christmas, even in rural Prince Edward Island. Vera was greatly anticipating a visit from Santa Claus and explicitly expected a store-bought good from him, such as a coloring book, crayons, or a new book. She was also delighted at, but not surprised, by the store-bought hard candy from her uncle who managed the Brace McKay and Coast store in Summerside. Although Vera doesn't remember what she received for Christmas, 
She did remark that it certainly wasn't a doll because there was not enough money for a doll. Not that dolls weren't available or popular, her family just simply couldn't afford one. Even in this description of a rural, very humble rural Prince Edward Island Christmas, the spirit of commercialism is creeping through. And Vera's Christmas seems to vary greatly from that of the Harris family, despite her living in a rural community and the Harris's in an urban center. The Harris family makes limited mention of gifts, the only ones being homemade, no mention of Christmas trees, Santa, candy, concerts, or anything special besides a little greenery for decoration, mince pies, and a plum pudding. It's very interesting to think that a great number of people existed in history who were small children at the time of the Harris's 1950s Christmases, and then they would have gone on to witness their grandchildren or great-grandchildren experiencing a vastly different Christmas than the one that they experienced as a child. And they would have had no concept of Christmas trees, Santa, store-bought presents, or Christmas candy, and then watch this transformation take place during their lifetime. And now I want to turn our attention back to historical print media and investigate the phenomenon we were talking about earlier, but more locally. Not just in North America, not just in Canada, but here on the island. And even Prince County and Bedeck specifically. Now, when I was searching for material to write this talk, I remembered that I was standing in the former Strong, Wright, and Callback store. So perhaps there existed some local Christmas advertisements that showcased the same point. Christmas advertisements becoming um, more prevalent, detailed, and consumerist in nature. Um, sorry, the best way I thought to do so would be to comb through the newspaper archives to see what was out there. Um, how, did, how was Christmas advertised <coughs> to local consumers around this time period? Was there any difference in the context, the volume, or the publishing date of the local advertisements? This surely would uh, provide a glimpse as to what Christmas looked like from a commercial standpoint right here. Now something interesting to get us started on this point is the Island Newspaper Archives, which is an online digitized uh, newspaper archive, allows you to search for a certain word or phrase and shows you how often that um, phrase shows up in different categories of newspapers. And I don't want to give the impression that this is a complete database, as there's still a lot of digitizing to do, but it is an excellent researcher and provides a, a great number of information. Um, to, to, um, so, I, I feel it provides very valuable insight into the uh, frequency with which words and terms were being used in these advertisements. For example, if you search by decade across all Prince Edward Island newspapers, the term Christmas presents appears one time in the 1840s, mm -hmm. 22 times in the 1850s, 67 times in the 1870s, and 347 times in the 1890s. Even the term Christmas only appears five times in the 1830s, 166 times in the 1850s, and if you jump ahead to 1920, the word appears 3,427 times. And these numbers show a massive increase in frequency with which the term is being printed in the newspapers and shows how Christmas went from being almost non-existent in print to being extremely prominent. Now with these interesting statistics in mind, um, we can now turn our attention to the first ever printed Christmas advertisements on Prince Edward Island. Um, like, um, now these advertisements come from the morning news and semi-weekly advertisers. So at the time, it was a politically neutral penny paper, and it was published in Charlottetown, but its coverage was the entire island. Um, and so it's a little difficult to see um, from this projection, um, but you can see that there's a number of advertisements here on this page. Um, and so the early, one of them here um, is from, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so uh, I believe I left one out. So there was one from eight, from December 20th, 1840. Oh. I was going to say, I thought I had left. Oh, okay, there we are. Yeah. Okay, so this one is December 20th, 1843. Um, sorry, this is the first ever that um, that is available. It may not be the first one that was published. Um, just like I mentioned before, not everything is digitized yet, but this, at the moment, this is the earliest one available, and it probably is one of the earliest ones. There may not be many before it. Um, so from eight, December 20th, 1843, and it's advertising Christmas boxes and New Year's gifts. And they're all available at the store of Miss McMurray on Sydney Street in Charlottetown. Mm -hmm. Although Miss McMurray doesn't go into details on what her store sells, 
She says that persons who feel disposed to present their friends with Christmas boxes and New Year's gifts will find an assortment of fancy articles for that purpose at her store. And Ms. Murray's advertisement seems to give the impression that the practice of gift giving um, is, um, for this time of year, is not expected, traditional, or common. Perhaps it's even a rise in trend that she's hoping to benefit from. It's also interesting that she talks about gift exchange among friends instead of family, and certainly not to children. Uh, Miss McMurray was only one of two merchants to post a Christmas advertisement that year. Uh, Mr. G. F. Cooper, who had a store on Queen Street, posted an ad just three days later um, that mentioned um, that does mention Christmas presents in the last line of his ad. Right. So now I'd like to continue to narrow our focus down to Prince County. Now, of course, the bulk of the material um, from the county is going to come from Summerside. Being the local urban center, they have the most stores, they have the highest population as well. Um, and I can imagine that on the off chance that William Strong, Colin Wright, or Will Callback, all former owners of the store in which the museum is, is today, um, in the off chance that they didn't carry what the locals were looking for, or if they just happened to be in Summerside on that day, um, many of the locals from this very community would have participated in some of these uh, special Christmas uh, advertisements going on. Um, so the Summerside Journal first went to print um, in 18, 1865, and the first Christmas advertisements appear here in December of 1866. As you can see, there's six Christmas ads grouped together, and let's take a look at their content. What are they advertising? Um, the first one says, Merry Christmas, and promotes groceries. Um, the second is also for groceries. Mind you, some fancy <coughs> things are listed, like confectionery and candy citron. Um, the third is also for groceries, um, but also soap, candles, and kerosene oil. Very important. Um, the fourth is for groceries and also mentions fancy goods suitable for Christmas presents. And now the fifth is for raisins, and, um, and the sixth is for Christmas and New Year's gifts at a bookstore. And this assortment of ads is very telling. Stocking up on food and provisions seems to be almost the entire purpose of these ads, with presents rarely mentioned or perhaps just an afterthought on the last line. And you'd be wrong to assume that the following year would have been met with the same enthusiasm, because in 1867, there were, uh, there were across all December issues, one Christmas ad was repeated in four publishings. In the following year, 1867, just one Christmas advertisement was published one time. It's very evident that it just wasn't a deal. Um, a relatively insignificant economic or consumerist event. Um, from the food center focus, one could even argue there was more the time of year than anything else, as it would have been a good time of year to um, encourage buyers to stock up on goods for the winter. Uh, here we have an evolution of Summerside Christmas ads displayed from the 19th century. Although the earliest ads do focus on presents, um, toys are only mentioned second to last on the list. Um, the rest of the products would have been better suited to gift giving amongst adults, um, like photographs of the royal family, uh, jewelry, pipes, and perfume. Other ads at the time um, discuss Christmas geese and turkeys for sale, a temperance tea party, um, and a, uh, a concert, Christmas cards for sale, and a Christmas Day supper. However, in 1885, you can clearly see improvements in print technology, and the nature of ads is focusing in on material goods rather than the focus on food. And community events, sorry, and community, uh, the focus on food and community events a few decades before starts to give way to an emphasis on, on uh, consumer goods. Once we are fully in the Edwardian era, you can see an entirely new type of Christmas advertisement taking place. Detailed images of Santa Claus, decorated living rooms, scenes of children playing, and images of toys all appear in, um, in Summerside newspaper advertisements. The Holman's, Christ the Holman's Christmas advertisements get more and more, more elaborate, elaborate and detailed. As we leave the Edwardian era and look at the post-World War I advertisements, um, you can see that they go from relatively modest um, to advertisements to discussing their toy department 
Um, and even one mentions that they have over 30,000 toys available from seven different countries to choose from. As you can clearly see, the, mi mi the nature of these ads goes from a mix of um, advertisements for food and groceries, provisions for winter, community events, um, concerts, and in a matter of a generation, it transforms into being solely consumerist and focused on presence. Now, as for the callback store specifically, the reality is there is hardly any Christmas advertisements. Now, the earliest one I was able to find comes from 1932, when Ralph Callback had already taken over the store from his father. Um, and a great number of ads were published later on for Christmas time, mostly in the 1950s is when you find them. And it's probably fair to suggest that Will Callback didn't need to do a lot of advertising for the holidays. He was one of very few stores in the area at the time. Um, and people wouldn't, couldn't travel far to explore other uh, shopping options. Um, and there isn't anything at all for, for Colin Wright and William Strong, the previous owners of the store before him. And, but before I concluded my research, I did want to take a moment to comb through um, Colin Wright and William Colbeck's leisure books, just to take a peek, just out of curiosity, um, to see if there was any special Christmas purchases during that time. And there were. In the earliest years of the, of the earliest years of my, I don't know how that one got moved over there. Um, the earliest years of my search um, didn't produce much, uh, but as the years go on, um, you can see that every single year Will sold Christmas geese and ducks. Every single year he writes geese for Christmas, geese for Christmas, geese for Christmas. Uh, every single year and ducks, and even a few instances um, I uncovered some more special purchases. Henry Secord, he bought two books in December of 1886. And Mrs. Callback went all out in 1881. She bought a new tea set, ribbons, silk, and a journal, among a great number of other, uh, of other things. And this is all to suggest that people did, in fact, turn to this store for their holiday purchases, no matter how humble or extravagant, with any, without um, any print advertisements telling them to do so. As I conclude, I hope you found all of this information interesting and relevant to this upcoming season. And my biggest takeaway from all of this is that the holidays are all about what you personally make of it. Christmas has been celebrated in countless different ways um, and sometimes not even celebrated at all by even the most devout Christians in history. The spirit of gift giving, present exchange, holiday purchases is a manufactured and modern tradition that was intentionally developed to encourage you to depart with your hard-earned money in order to enrich others. So don't feel the need to give in to that pressure if it doesn't feel right to you. Besides, if you travel back in time to spend Christmas with your great or great-great-grandparents, they would only expect you to be there to, to share a meal and enjoy an evening of storytelling and, and togetherness. Thank you. the Western world, like you know, Victorian era and whatnot, many of their celebrations would have started around Christmas time, but the biggest day of celebration would have been for New Year's. So I'm assuming that that's sort of where that comes from, is that that was already the more important day. So by throwing in that, that um, you know, throwing in New Year's or whatnot, um, would just make it a little easier for people to relate to, because that was already a, kind of an important thing to them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. And if you take a look at it, uh, we've got a small card display just in the very front of the lobby there. Many of the cards are wishing people Happy New Year's, um, even not mentioning Christmas at all, some of them. Yeah, absolutely. So at the beginning, you had a picture of uh, Queen Victoria mm -hmm. and Prince Albert in the Christmas tree. Right. Do you think that is 
the royalty class within Europe or wherever picking up on another fad from another royalty, or was, or was that kind of encouraged, trying to encourage the commercialization of some degree? Yes, well, so Albert, he was, he was German, and that was already a very popular German okay, practice. Yeah. Um, but yes, him bringing it, um, I'm not sure that that was intentional, that that was, because a Christmas tree itself really doesn't, isn't terrifically commercial, especially most people at the time, I'm sure, just sort of got it up from the woods. Um, I think that one was very much, um, in my opinion, just sort of an accident. It was something that the family did, it was unique, it was novel, it hadn't really been seen in England before, and they published it showcasing this very special and um, very unique thing that the family was doing, um, blending the two families, the two traditions, blending the two royal families, um, and that really caught on through print media, and it just kind of goes to show how how important print media was to people and how widely it could disseminate an idea and how quickly it could, yeah. The, the ads, uh, I think you showed one in 1865, was when that, the journal pioneer, or the Sunset Journal mm -hmm. came out. And then the, the Christmas ad was in 1866. Right. So how did the, like, was that just the kind of the beginning of advertising in, in general? Like, is it possible that it's, you know, it's all just new? Like, advertising itself was new, and so Christmas ads wouldn't be that? Mm -hmm. No, it's a really great question. Um, and certainly, um, if you look back, um, that's the time when that particular journal started, or that particular newspaper. But if you look back before in previous um, years, I mean, there was, in some parts of North America, there was even um, newspapers in the 1700s or whatnot. And there certainly, there is advertisements. Um, you'll notice that they're much different, though. They're very narrow, they're very small, tiny print, um, but you certainly see them. And a lot of them are quite funny. They'll say, um, they'll say, um, you know, read this, and then it'll, it'll have all the information. Um, and they really do try to capture people's attention. So yeah, there certainly was a lot of advertisements before that, um, but these are the first times that you're seeing Christmas-specific ones. Um, yes, because I did search through earlier newspapers, but if you type in the term, you know, sale, you're going to find things way earlier than this. You're going to find things in the early 1800s, depending on what newspaper you're looking at. When you type in Christmas, that, you don't start to get it till then. Yeah, but great question, yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much for coming out. We have um, some juice and cookies and snacks. Feel free. Um, and if any questions uh, manage to come into your mind while you've got any snack, feel free to ask. Thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.